Now our first presenter today is Olivia Brady, who will be talking about the women of ancient Rome, a life outside, outside the shadows. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, and thank you everyone for being here. Last semester was, for a historian, quite a roller coaster. Pompeii is just a paradox for a historian because you think you have it figured out and then something else is discovered and everything you believe is shattered. So it's very interesting as you dive into your research to find that your ideas and your curiosities are only furthered, they're broken, they're, they're disproven, but then they're proven again. So as I was doing my research, I had to make up my mind to go one way and stick with it and then just hope it worked because as Dr. Lowe said, they're still finding new things and there's still so much yet to be discovered. So I am going to present you today with information that I have found. Sorry. I may also deafen you. Um, I'm going to present you today with information I have found, and I'm going to let you make up your own mind about the women of Pompeii. So, how many of you are married gentlemen in the room? Okay, so you, a few of you understand, and I'm sure my ladies in the room understand as well, that though history tends to paint women as being a very subservient gender, um, we all know sometimes it's not always the case. And even if we do like to hide in the shadows, there's always that little whisper that we play a role in the public life. So the women of Pompeii, again, there's no real concrete evidence to say one way or another, but historically, people tend to assume that the women of Pompeii were subservient. They played a housewife type role. They were not allowed to participate in politics. They were not allowed to do anything in the public life without a male relative. This could be their husband, this could be their father. It even was their sons, once their sons were old enough to be considered escorts to their female relatives. So historically we tend to lean on the side that women were housewives. They were child bearers. They were homemakers. But again, my women in the room, you know, it's not always the case. And one great example of this is Mamia. She was a public priestess in Pompeii, and though we don't know quite as much about her as we would like to, there's still enough to make us question this whole housewife role. To begin, she had a temple erected in her honor in Pompeii. And now for those who are not familiar with the structure of Pompeii, a temple being erected in your honor or your name is very significant. That is something that they only reserved for the highest of public figures. Usually your male public figures, your emperors, your constables, things like that. But here we have Mamia who is a female, no one really knows her background, and she has this beautiful large temple erected in her honor. Not only that, but at the time, Augustus was the emperor. And again, for those who don't necessarily understand the structure of Pompeii, in order to erect a temple, you had to have the emperor's approval. So if you have an emperor telling you as a female that yes, this temple can be erected, you know, here's the funds, that's a huge deal. That's not something that would happen if she were just some subservient housewife that no one really paid much attention to. So it begs the question, how much power did Maumia really have? And again, for those who don't necessarily understand Pompeii, we can also see that her power and her influence is shown through her burial. In, Roman, in ancient Roman history, burials are very significant. 
they are erected in places where people will constantly be looking at them because Romans believed that the more someone looks at your temple, the more someone looks at your burial site, the longer you are kept alive in spirit. If you are not thought about, if you are not remembered, you disappear. But if people are constantly walking by, reading your tombstone, reading the inscriptions on your temple, then you are remembered and therefore your spirit lives on. So people would pay huge amounts of money, would have to, you know, basically dogfight to have certain burial sites and temples. Well, Mamia had what we like to call the prime spot for her burial ground. She was perfectly erected in her burial site. She had a beautiful inscription. She had depictions of sacrifices on her tomb, or excuse me, her temple. Um, and so again, this begs the question, someone who is a nobody, a low life, just a female, why would she have something so wonderful and beautiful to commemorate her life? Why would she be buried in something so magnificent? So there are, there are arguments that um, it could have been that her family was the one who influenced this. However, her temple, or excuse me, her burial had no mention of family. And again, for those who have family in the room, I assume we would all want at least a little mention, a little shout out to our family, you know, mother, father, son, daughter. She had nothing. No members of her family, no husband, no children listed on her tomb. So that begs the question, was she by herself? Did she do all of this by herself? And unfortunately, there's just not enough evidence to say yes or no. Maybe there's part of the temple that we're missing. Maybe there's part of her life that is still yet to be discovered. But as of now, she has a temple erected in her name, given to her, or given permission to build by Augustus, the priest, or excuse me, the emperor of Rome, and she is buried in one of the most magnificent temples in Pompeii. I'll let you decide. Another significant female role, and, th and she, thankfully, we have a lot of evidence about her. A lot, I say. In, in Pompeii terms, a lot can still seem like a very little amount. But Eumachia is actually a very well-known, very well-understood female in Pompeii. She was very wealthy, born into a very wealthy family. We do thankfully know her female, or excuse me, her familial connection. And she was a public priestess. Now, she was able to use her family wealth to gain her status. Still, you know, that's pretty impressive considering she was a female. And in a time where it didn't matter how much money you had, if you were still a female, a lot of people considered you lesser. She was able to build her public name and build her own sense of power within the community. Um, she actually used her funding and her money and her wealth to build the Eumachia building in the town center of Pompeii. Again, Pompeii infrastructure tells us that the town center is the main part of town. It's where you want everything. If you have the money, if you have the power, that's where you put your things. So the equivalent of that in Florence would be lovely Wilson Park. So imagine having the money and the influence to build your building in Wilson Park. That's a pretty high status for her. So she was able to use her wealth and power to basically put her name in the town center or the town hall. And that shows a huge amount of influence. There is no um, mention of her spouse having any influence with this building. So she did this all on her own. Now, Mamia and Umaki are the two key uh, females that a lot of historians lean on when they're talking about females in Pompeii, because that's who we have the most evidence on. And again, unfortunately, they're just isn't enough to conclusively say yes or no, this is what was happening, this was what you know was going on, because pieces are destroyed, pieces are, are still buried, you know, however many meters down in the ground. But um, those are the two key figures. Now there are, thankfully, a few other females that have been 
found little little traces of them found throughout the city. And as Dr. Lowe mentioned earlier, graffiti is a very good way to tell about a person's life. Graffiti was everywhere throughout Pompeii. Think of it as the billboards of today. Um, there were billboards, these graffitis everywhere, and females were, for the most part, not allowed to put any graffiti anywhere, but there are several public priestesses that we're not quite sure who they were, but we know they are female based on what they are um, advertising. So there were several public priestesses who were able to put their graffiti throughout Pompeii. There were several who have smaller but still significant burial sites, um, even temples that mention females um, throughout Pompeii. Again, things that at the time should be considered significant deals. I know it doesn't seem like it now, but when you have lived a life or, or you live in a, um, a historical period where you are considered nothing, you are merely just a human being that is to bear children, keep the house clean and ready to go, um, you have no public life, you're not allowed to leave the house without a male figure, even then it's discouraged, you're not allowed to speak or conduct any sort of public affairs. Um, to have these things erected in your honor, to have these things spread out across a huge city like that in the public eye is very telling. And it tells us that maybe we got it wrong. Maybe history is telling a very different story if we just listen. So with that, keep in mind that burial sites and temples are very significant ordeals. Like I said, it would be the equivalent of you know, constructing something in your name, in your honor, in Wilson Park or in the middle of UNA's campus, something that has your name only on it. And as a female in Pompeii, that's what these women were capable of doing. On top of that, they were buried with what was considered the highest honor. They were buried in the hot spot of burial grounds so that people would see them, would remember them. I don't know about you, but to me, that is telling a story of a female who should not and does not want to be forgotten, not only by herself, but by the people she served as a priestess or as a political figure.